Amen. All right, if you, uh, if you haven't figured it out, you're stuck with me, and apparently a dude can't wear a button-down shirt and khaki pants or carry a big Bible unless he's preaching around here. Um, man, I, I took some ribbon for that this morning, and I have, I have promised to show up next time in a tank top and my iPad. <laughs> and depending on how this goes, maybe, maybe even like a mid-drift thing. Um, man. Um, so, uh, so here, here we are. We're off, we're off to the races. You're stuck with me for, for 30 minutes. Um, normally, we are expository in how we preach. So uh, uh, we typically here at Emmaus, we go through things. That's a fancy word for kind of going through things verse by verse. And so we take scripture. Uh, we run through it. Next week, Vic is, is starting us into a journey into Luke. Um, and we'll be there in a while, but before that, I've got the opportunity to share with you, uh, and I want to talk today about grace. Um, I'm going to talk about grace, and we're going to try to look at grace as an attribute of God, as part of the character, the essence, the being of God. So we're going to just jump right into some scripture, um, and if you have a Bible that is uh, bigger than mine or smaller than mine or on your phone, you can turn to it. It's a uh, John 1, we're going to look at verses uh, 14, 16, and 17 here. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So um, regardless of the size of your Bible, um, and, and it depends on the version, but grace is going to show up about 130 times in the New Testament. Uh, and so four of those times are contained in these two verses. And this, this is sort of the foundation, if you will. This is like the baseline of what we're going to be talking today. So grace upon grace, grace upon grace that God gives us. And there's three aspects of this that we need to kind of get to to get to the main point of, of what I hope to share today. And they all come from the scripture. Um, and the first is that God's grace is directed to children of God. Um, so this may not be a popular point with everyone, um, but, I, you know, it's what the scripture says. And not everyone here on this earth is a child of God. You know, I think some of us like to believe that. Sometimes we hear that. You know, everybody is made in God's image, therefore everybody is a child of God. Um, that's just not what Scripture says. You can, you can, uh, well, I'd prefer you not shoot the messenger here, but uh, uh, that's, that's what Scripture teaches us, right? And so, you know, how do I know that and where does that come from? We just have to go up in Scripture to a, verses, a couple of verses before that. And so if you look at the two verses that precede that, John 1, 12 through 13, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so here John is telling us what does it mean to be a, uh, to be a child of God. Uh, and it says to all who have received him, in this case he's talking about Jesus, and who have believed in his name. So scripture defines a child of God, children of God, as uh, those who have received Jesus and believe in his name. And then we flow to these next scriptures, and the grace that we're talking about today is principally going to be grace that God extends to his children. That's not to say that there isn't grace that God extends to, to the whole world, this form of common grace that we all receive, but we're going to focus on this grace that God gives to his children who are followers and believers in Jesus. Um, so that's the first point from the scripture. Uh, the second is that grace is an attribute of God. So we're looking at, at John 1 uh, in verse uh, you know, 14, I think it says, uh, Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we've got God here, God the Father, we've got Jesus, you know, Jesus the God-man sent, sent here to earth. Uh, and we get this defined as both being full of grace and truth. And so when we talk about an attribute of God, it's a, it's a disposition of God to act in a certain way. It's even beyond that. Um, it's part of his being. It's part of what defines him. 
uh, if we want to if we want to use grammar, it's like a noun, an ad adverb, and a verb. Excuse me, an adjective and a verb. You know, all at once, packed in. You know, to to grace. So it's an attribute of God. It's part of what makes God who He is, and it flows. You know, in His presence, and it flows eternally. Um, so you know, one of the scriptures that that I liked as a kid growing up, I had to memorize scriptures in kindergarten. One for each level of the alphabet, and it's funny how many of those I remember. Um, but the one I liked the most um, was First John four eight, God is love, and I liked it the most because it was the shortest. Uh, could remember it really easily, right? Um, God is love, and the same applies here. I think God is grace. It's part of the definition of what makes God God, and part of His being. So, as we're we're building the foundation around grace, you know, it's the grace we're talking about today is for God's children. It's an attribute of God. Uh, and then we see how we get grace, which is through Jesus Christ. We see from the scripture that for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Um, and so it came, you know, from, from Jesus or through Jesus, available to everyone, but not necessarily received by everyone. So foundation again, God's grace directed to God's children, Grace is an attribute of God, uh, and we, we obtain that grace through Jesus Christ. So um, one of the things that, that I believe, um, and I've learned over time that just because I believe it doesn't necessarily in itself make it true, um, but I believe this is true, uh, as I think that the modern church, particularly the American church, uh, is very me-centric. Um, it, is, it's, it is in our nature, it's in our culture, it is in our society. Um, uh, and, and that applies you know, across the board into the evangelistic church. Um, and, and what I mean by that is when we look at scriptures and we look at God's word, we're often starting with a place of how does this apply to me in my life? Like that is, that, that's the first step that we take. That's the first lens that we look. You know, how does this apply to me? What practical application do I need to take? You know, how should my life change because of this? Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I would contend and I would argue that it should not be our first step, right? Instead of starting with me, I think when we look at Scripture, we should start with God. You know, what is, the, what is this knowledge of God and how can we learn, you know, about him and about his character? Uh, and what we see when that happens is that then the practical application flows through to our life. And, and the analogy I want to make is just even to our own uh, salvation and sanctification. Salvation is how we're saved uh, through Jesus for our sins. Sanctification is, is how we kind of get our life straight and become more uh, and more like Jesus, right? And so if, you, if you're here and you're a believer, um, you know, hopefully you, you know and you've seen, if you first tried to get your life straight and to fix everything and to get all the sin out of the way, before you came to Christ, before you said, I'm going to follow him, then you were just spinning on a hamster wheel. Okay. Right? I think, I think we know that. If you try to fix everything first without God, it's, not, it's impossible. We do not have that power. And part of God's grace is that through coming to know him and submitting our life to him, he then gives us the power to drive change. And so the analogy I'd make is when we look at scripture, it should be the same way. We should first seek to learn and understand God's character, God's nature, the knowledge of God, uh, and then that carries through to, to practical application in our lives. Um, and we can have a, a, a God-centric view that we start with. So um, just, just a quick analogy of our culture, um, and my nine-year-old's not in here so I can share this because it would probably embarrass her. But... Uh, <laughs> Probably, probably two months ago, I don't know, maybe, maybe three or four weeks ago, um, Ivy uh, had put together this beautiful piece of one-page artwork. She'd done it on her own. She might have been hanging in her room, you know, very ornate, a lot of coloring. There's some words in the middle, and, and I saw it, and Steph Stephanie saw it as well, and at some point, we kind of rolled our eyes together at it, but um, she's nine. I, she's homeschooled, you know. She, she doesn't have a whole lot of access to, she's in a bubble, right? So she doesn't have a whole lot of access to the outside culture. Um, but written on this piece of paper was, your life is what you make of it. 
You know, it's really ornate and really, you know, really pretty. Um, and I remember just sort of looking at that and thinking, oh my goodness, this is something that comes out of the tail end of a four-legged animal with hoofs, right? Um, you know, Ivy hasn't gone out and, and listened to Tony Robbins or all the self-help that's out there, but somehow she would absorbed that from the culture. And it's just, I mean, it's just a lie. It's a lie. Our life is not what we make of it if we're believers and we're followers of Christ. I mean, God directs our way and directs our path. And we live in such a self-help society that first looks for, you know, practical application instead of first looking to the God that ordains everything, that it's easy as believers and Christians for us to fall into that same category. So today the challenge for us as we look at grace, what we want to do uh, is we want to try to look at it as an attribute of God. What does it mean that the, the grace as a, is, is part of God's character? What does that really mean and what does it look like? Uh, and then, you know, therefore, how does it apply to our lives? And so uh, I mentioned 1 John 4, 8. You know, God is love. God is also grace. Grace is an attribute ingrained in his character. It's eternal because it's part of God's character. It's ever-present uh, and it's never-ending. You know, it doesn't run out. Uh, it is powerful by the nature of it being God's character. It is, it, there's power to that grace, uh, and it's purposeful. So there's meaning that flows through it. You know, in all aspects of our lives, if we're children of God, then it is extended, you know, it's extended to us. Um, so that's going to be the framework of, of what we're going to look at today. And I kind of want to just, like, pause for a minute right there and and go on a little bit of a rabbit trail. But I want to pause... Um, to say thank you to this body. Uh, for, for most of you that have been here, um, you know that June 9th I had a liver transplant. Uh, this was uh, my third liver now, the one I was born with, and then about nine years ago I um, uh, had, a, had a first transplant. The experience this time was a lot different than nine years ago. Nine years ago uh, I was deathly ill. I was so sick. Uh, that many people and many doctors did not think I would survive. Um, in fact, to some degree, uh, there's at least one doctor that had put me on about a 30-day countdown, and, um, you know, frankly, I think a lot had given up on me. Uh, God miraculously intervened. I don't have time to go through the story today. Um, it, 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 it's a long story of all the ways that he miraculously intervened in what I believe is just a supernatural um, interference to, to come in and, and save me so that I could be alive. Um, he did it not by going into my liver and you know, miraculously healing it, but he actually did it through the body of, of Christ, through believers from all different aspects of my life, through thousands and thousands of people praying um, uh, in a very short period of time, um, you know, found uh, a liver for me, and, and I was saved. I was, I was saved, I'm alive because of it. Uh, so that was nine years ago. Um, probably three to five years ago, it became apparent to me that uh, largely because I was so sick when I received this first liver, that it had a lot of acute issues and uh, that it would eventually run out of steam. Uh, and it did. Um, this time, through God's grace, the experience was, was a lot different. I was, I was not uh, on death's doorstep. Uh, but I was sick, and I did need a liver, and frankly, I got one a lot earlier than I thought I would. And so that happened on June 9th. Um, we've been back a few weeks since then, and many of you have come up, and, and the conversation kind of goes like this. You say, man, Ben, I'm so glad you're back. We've been praying for you. And I say, thank you. And then, you know, there's sort of a pause, and a couple of you kind of grab my arm, or, you know, you slow me down and say, no, 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 Ben, you don't really understand. I've been praying for you. Like, really praying for you. Like, praying for you more than I've prayed for anybody in my life. And then there's like a little bit of an awkwardness because I have no idea what to say because there's nothing to say. <laughs> there is no way that, that I can thank you, thank this body, thank believers, thank you individually um, uh, for that. I, I really can't. There's not words, words that describe it. So I publicly want to say thank you to Emmaus for your prayers. I publicly want to say thank you to those individuals that have been praying for me. And I want to point us back to a scripture, uh, to 2 Corinthians 1, 11. 
And this is, uh, this is the end of a series of scriptures, and Paul is talking about like some suffering that he's gone through where he thought he was going to die, um, and he was saved, and then now he's going through the suffering again, and he's writing this letter to the church, and he sort of finishes it by saying, <clears throat> you also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our, ha- our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. So there's two things here, two big things to me. Uh, one is that God grants blessing through the prayers of many. Like when his children, when many of us pray, what the scripture says is that, that God answers often, sometimes answers those prayers, sometimes in the way we've been praying, sometimes in a different way. But, but Paul is saying that it is important that many pray. And then there's a second piece of this that, that, that gets extended, and Paul says, so that many will give thanks when those prayers are answered. And I'm going to add on to that a little bit, not like in the Galatians, I think it's Galatians manner in which you're eternally condemned if you add on to Scripture, not that way. Um, I'm going to add on to what I believe Paul is saying. I think he says, so many give thanks and their faith will be increased. Right, so when we pray for something, and we pray and we pray and we pray, and God answers those prayers, sometimes quickly in the way that we've we've prayed, sometimes it's years later, and maybe it's not in the exact manner that we pray, but we know that God's answered those prayers, we then give thanks to God. That's, That's our reaction, right? It's a form of worship. And when we do that, our faith is increased. We are more likely to be able to believe and trust God because we've prayed for something, and then we've seen the outcome from God. Um, So so it's easy, right, relatively easy in my situation, on the back end, when we see God answers those prayers in the way that that we wanted him to, right, with healing, to say, oh, man, I can see God's grace in that. God, I'm so, so thankful for your grace. But if this grace is ever-flowing, ever-present, in all conditions, in all circumstances, then it's also got to be there in the things in life that are hard. So the grace has got to be present, pre- present in the things that are, that are tough and the things that uh, don't necessarily go the way that we want them to go. Um, and so, you know, as we dig deeper, you know, into this on the surface level, okay, yeah, easy for me to thank God for his grace in saving me from my sins, easy for me to thank him for his grace, for putting food on my table, but what about God's grace when he doesn't heal us? And what about God's grace for the man who suddenly lost his life, and for his family, whose liver I have now have and am alive because of? And what about God's grace when, you know, cancer shows up and it's not healed? Or things don't go the way that we want them to. Where's God's grace in that? And so I want us to look at at three different places where we wouldn't normally say, oh, I see God's grace in that. But I want us to look at three places that that God's grace shows up in the hard things. So the first uh, is I want to talk about difficult circumstances. Uh, And God's grace is present in difficult circumstances uh, even when we doubt him. So we're going to go all the way back to the Old Testament. Uh, we're going to look at Exodus 17, 1 through 6. Um, sometimes the Old Testament is, is uh, tough to, to get through. Um, we do have an upcoming resident expert on that. Pete Diamond is studying the Old Testament this semester. And so if you have any questions about the Old Testament, don't ask me. Find Pete, ask him, tell him I sent you. Um, we're going to look at we're going to look at Exodus. I'm going to read this scripture, and then I'm going to sort of set the framework for you, and then we're going to talk about how how God's grace is present in it. Uh, so we are Exodus 17 verse one, and I'm going to read all the way through um, uh, verse six. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and kept camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why do you bring us out of Egypt to kill us 
and our children and our livestock with thirst. So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and taking in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Okay, so very important to understand the context here. Um, I'm going to go, I'm gonna go through it quickly, but for generations and generations, the people of Israel, God's people, uh, had been in slavery uh, to the Egyptians. God says, okay, I've had enough of that, and he brings down some crazy stuff. There's hailstorms and frogs and um, the Nile turned into blood, all these, all these supernatural miracles, and, and finally, effectively, the firstborn of all the Egyptians uh, were killed. And through those miracles, finally, uh, Pharaoh says, okay, you guys can go. And the, the people of Israel, not 200, not 20,000, likely two to three million, uh, escaped from slavery, and they followed God. They followed a cloud, right? And God, God took them here and there, and he brings them up to a valley, and there's mountains on the left, mountains on the right, the Red Sea behind them. Uh, and then Pharaoh decides that he doesn't like the deal he made, and he sends the most powerful army in the world you know, across the plains to slaughter God's people. Um, God's people cried out. They doubt God. They complain to Moses. And then God uh, opens up the Red Sea. The people go through the Red Sea. They get to the other side. The Egyptians follow God closes the Red Sea, and we've, you know, the, the people of Israel have witnessed um, the greatest, at least, environmental miracle of all time, right? One of the greatest miracles of all time, um, and certainly the greatest where God takes control of the forces of nature supernaturally, you know, in the presence of his people. So they go through that, uh, and then about six weeks later, so not six years, like six weeks later, they find themselves in the valley of sin, um, not actual sin in terms of doing evil or wrong, just sort of the name of the place. And they find themselves in this valley, uh, and they're hungry, and so they complain, and God provides manna and quail so that they can eat. And then they move on from there, and they, go, they, they find themselves here uh, in the wilderness, in the wilderness without water. So I'm just, I'm trying to set the framework. This is like two months after the Red Sea. This is like in short proximity to a very clear miracle from God. And they're there saying, we're thirsty. You know, did you bring us here to die? And they're not just saying, why God? Why did you bring us here, right? They are accusing, they are assigning evil to God. They're doing it through Moses, who, who Moses is is sort of the median there, right? But they are, they are saying, God, you are evil. You have brought us out here, you know, to kill us. And so before we condemn the Israelites, because I know when I see this, I, my first reaction is, well, gosh, if I saw the Red Sea open, there's no way I would doubt God after that. But before we condemn them, I mean, think back to our lives, think back to your life, and how many times... Can you look at a place where you know God moved and worked, and then shortly down the road from that, you find yourself doubting him, trying to figure out if he's present? You know, it's like the Israelites, they're there, and it's human nature, but they get there, and they're probably sitting there thinking, well, gosh, maybe that, maybe that wasn't the Lord. Maybe it was just like a really strong wind that came in at the exact right time you know, and, and there's this a one in a billion possibility, and we happen to be there. Maybe that wasn't the Lord's hand, right? I know, I know I've struggled with that. I know that as much as I and we celebrated um, God's provision in my life and celebrated his grace, you know, nine years ago, man, it, was, it, was, it was hard. It was hard to find out that I might have to go through that whole thing again. You know, how many times do we look and we celebrate what he's done and then we get down the road and we're just like the Israelites and we say, well, wait a minute, maybe that wasn't God, you know? Maybe that was just the circumstances and, and I really just got lucky and God wasn't present in that and, and we forget. So the, the, the point 
the point that I, the main point I want to make from the scriptures that applies to grace um, is that even in these difficult circumstances, even when we doubt him, God's grace is present. Uh, so, so God led his people to this spot in the wilderness. He led them intentionally to a spot without water. And if, if you're a Christian, if, if you're a child of God, that, that is your life, right? God leads us. Ephesians 1, 11, God works all things according to the counsel of his will. James 4, 15, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Uh, Job 121, the Lord gave and the Lord take away. So this may be you today. You may be at a waterless campsite, and you're looking around, and you're trying to figure out, you know, is God here? Is God present? I mean, the thing you need to remember is that God led you to that place. And you are not there by accident. And God is, I mean, what he's screaming out in this moment, just like he was with the Israelites, he's trying to say, just trust me, trust me. And we've got to remember that God has not promised us, God's grace is not a promise to us um, to deliver us to our own personal definition of a good life. That is not in Scripture. Um, his promise is that, that he's going to deliver us and he is going to provide us with grace. But even in this situation, even in this situation with the Israelites, do you know what he did? He provided them water. You know, God's grace, his life-giving presence and his grace was still there. He fulfilled his promise to provide for their needs, even in spite of the grumbling and in spite of the complaining. Um, and he does that in our, our life as well. You know, and so our problem generally, at least my problem, isn't believing whether or not God can do something. It's believing that he will. Right? It's believing that his, that his grace is going to do that. And, and the assurance that God gives us through his grace because of this character of God, because it is ever present, um, you know, is that his grace is with you. Second, second point, second place that it, it's a little harder to find grace. It's not so obvious. But God's grace, it is most powerful in our sins. Doesn't make sense necessarily on the surface. But remember how patient he was with the Israelites. So uh, I know for me, um, you know, I feel like that, that I can be a little bit patient. Like if, if somebody does something that's wrong to me, makes, makes, me, um, uh, makes me mad, right? Does something that's wrong. Like I can be patient one time, I can be patient two times, but, but if it just keeps coming back and keeps coming back, eventually my patient runs out and I just become angry. And thankfully it's not the same way with God. Uh, he is patient with our sins. Um, I'm not suggesting there's not consequence to our sins. If you play out the story with the Israelites, there's plenty of consequence. There's plenty of consequence to the sin that's in your life, but God is patient with you. Um, and sin is a problem that we cannot solve. You know, our self-help society teaches us that we can, you know. Sometimes we want to be strong and we think, oh, there's this sin in my life, and if I just do, like... X, Y, and Z and try really, really, really hard, then the sin is going to go away. And that may work for a day or a month or may work for a year, but, but we need God's grace um, to show up. In fact, we need God's grace so much that we need God's grace to show us our sin. Our human nature isn't, isn't to look at the things that we do that are wrong and say, oh man, that, you know, that's how broken I am. Our first nature is always to blame. I'm going to blame others. I'm going to blame circumstances. There's going to be some excuse for the, for the sin. There's going to be a reason other than me why the relationship is broken. Um, and we actually need God's grace to show up so that we can see our sin. And, and when he is so gracious to show us our sin, that is an act of grace. When he's there, then we can confess it, we can repent, we can repent of it, and then God can begin to heal our lives and change our behavior. But we even need his grace to see our sins. And then finally, uh, and I'm just quoting Paul here, and it's the opposite of, of human reaction, but where sin increases, uh, grace abounds even more. And so Paul tells us, you know, 
actually the more sin is in your life, the more grace God extends. God cannot run out of grace. The character of God is eternal. Grace is part of that defining character. God's grace does not run out. Grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. You know, God is grace. You can't, you can't out God God. God can't run out of himself. And so once again, not suggesting there aren't consequences to sin. If, if, if you're tempted with that, just read the rest of, the, of that chapter in Romans. Um, not suggesting that we go and intentionally sin. But we're told that God's grace and his character shows up in our sins in greater quantity the more sin that's there. Uh, and then finally, God's grace is saturated in our weakness. Another, another place that we don't necessarily see him. We don't go, oh gosh, Lord, I am so weak. I'm thankful for your grace for making me weak. Um, you know, our problem is never our weakness. God's grace covers that. Our worst enemy is our own strength or what we think is our own strength. We want people to think that we're, we're strong. We don't want people to see us as weak. Um, and as a, you know, as a result of that, uh, often in our lives, we just lie to ourselves, you know, when, when we're alone. And then we feign it, we fake it when we're in public, right? Sometimes we don't ask people to pray for us because, uh, because we don't want to appear weak. And we'll make excuses up for it, like, oh, I don't want to be a burden to them. Um, if you're asking me to move a couch, the thought may cross my mind that, oh, man, that's a burden. Now, I may still come and do it because I love you and I want to help you. But I can't think of a time in my life where anybody has ever come up and said, can you pray for me? Where a remote thought of, oh, man, this is a burden popped into my mind. And I would be willing to bet that applies to everybody here. Uh, it, is, it is not a burden um, you know, to pray for others. And I know, I know at times in my life, I've not asked for prayer because, you know, I didn't want to put that on somebody else. Um, again, that's just a lie and it's a feign of, of wanting to appear strong. Um, but instead, God uses our weakness, right? He, he confronts us in our own weakness so that we're forced to run to him. And, and I'm just, I mean, I'm going to finish this point just by, putting, by, by quoting Paul. So 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. Uh, this is Paul talking. Uh, so to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. So Paul didn't like the weakness either. He wanted to go. He prayed and prayed and prayed for it to go. Uh, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so, you know, here's, here's the Apostle Paul. Is the mechanism God used to spread the, you know, the faith, to spread the story of, of Jesus throughout the world. Um, he's got this weakness. We don't know exactly what it is. He is pleading with God to take it away. And God says, no, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Like God's grace is all the more present you know, in our weakness. So God's grace is present in most difficult circumstances. He's got you there intentionally. Uh, it's most powerful in our sins, and it's most saturated uh, in, in our weakness. So what, is, what does all this mean? So first of all, it means that grace covers our sins. If we've given our life to Jesus, um, if we've asked forgiveness for our sins, it doesn't matter how much sin is there, God's grace covers it. If, if you're kind of at the place today where, where, where you're struggling with this concept, or you're, you're, you're wondering, man... I've done all these things. How can I possibly, um, you know, how can I possibly be with God? How can He possibly love me? Uh, I mean, Scripture just tells us over and over and over again that you can't outsin Him. That His grace covers all those sins. And so, if you're sitting here today and that is keeping you, you know, 
the question of whether or not God can really forgive you, that's keeping you from, um, from coming to the Lord, um, you need to let it stop because God's grace is, is eternal in it. And secondly, God's grace is in our hardships. So his grace is all the more present and all the more powerful when we are facing trials and tribulations. You know, easier, easier for us to see when we're talking about forgiving sins. In the moment, unless we start with the character of God, knowing that grace as part of his, his, his character extends uh, to all things in his presence, you know, in the moment of hardship and trial, it's harder to see that. It's harder to see that grace, but it's there. Um, and, he, and he tells us, Hebrews 4.16, Let us then draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive and find grace to help in our time of need. So when we know God's character, when we know that this grace is an attribute of who he is, that it's eternal, that it's everlasting, overflowing you know, that it's presence when it's children, we really, like, know and believe that, then with confidence, like, our attitude when we, when, when we do face hardship and trial and we come to the Lord and pray for it, then our confidence becomes high. This is, like, the practical application that begins when you start with God's character. Suddenly, our faith and our confidence are high, and so we come and ask God for grace. We know that we're going to receive it, that we're going to find grace and mercy and help in our time of need. So we can draw um, confident to him. And rather than, you know, the whole Christian self-help life of let me try really, really hard to stop sinning or let me follow this playbook or, you know what, I'm just going to tell myself over and over and over again not to be afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid, right? Um, or, or even go where we're having to um, to beg for, for grace, believing, you know, the, the amount of begging to the Lord that we do or the number of times we ask for it is, 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 is somehow going to extend extra grace. Instead of like wishing and hoping and keeping our fingers crossed that God's going to extend his grace, we can go and pray and know with confidence that he's going to because that is part of his character. So for, so for me, um, and Levi, you guys can start coming up, but but, but for me, and I look back at my life, uh, the bi biggest miracle was God sustaining me. And, and so, you know, nine years ago, miraculous intervention, you know, saved my life. Huge miracle. There's zero doubt in my mind that that was the Lord intervening. But the harder part was when liver disease came back. And it was facing something that, fr quite frankly, I did not think that, that I could go through again. I mean, it was my worst fear. If you had asked me, you know, a year after my first transplant, then what is your biggest fear? It's like, oh, man, that I have to go through this again. There's no way. There's no way that I, that I could do that. Um, and yet God sustained me. He sustained me in things that I did not believe was possible. And that's the same grace that he extends to us um, 2 Corinthians 9, 8. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. So here's, here's what I can tell you. If, you're, you know, if you're sick today or somebody that you love is sick, what you can, what you can have confidence in what you can expect is grace. So for, for, for some, for a few, that grace is going to come with supernatural power from God. You're going to go to the doctor one day, and there's going to be cancer on the scan, and then you're going to come back the next day, and it's gone, and the doctors aren't going to be able to explain it. Um, and it's going to be a supernatural intervention. God still works that way sometimes. Uh, for, for most, you're going to receive grace, common grace, through doctors. Doctors and medicine and, and all the wonderful things that we have in modern me medicine, and God's going to heal you that way. And then for some, uh, for some of us, um, he's just going to simply sustain you with his power 
in a way and through circumstances that you did not think he could sustain you. And quite frankly, you could not sustain yourself by God's human power. His grace is going to show up in that. So the defining attributes of God's grace, it's endless in quantity, it's endless in power. Um, Grace upon grace upon grace, it means that he forgives our sins and we find salvation in him. And it also means that God knows who his children are. And he knows what we need. And he knows when we need it and how exactly we need it and exactly what he needs to do with his power in the right time, in the right place, so that his will can be done. He has directed us on the path that we find ourselves on. We're not there by accident. And through his grace, he always, always gives us the power that we need when we need it. When we need it. Um, so one of the things I would just in, encourage you with, you know, is if, if, you, if you need prayer, if you've got a place in your life and you just, um, you know, whether it's, whether it's health, whether it's um, sin, whether, whether it's just trying to get to know and understand God better, then, then find somebody to pray for you. It doesn't, have to be, it doesn't have to be Vic or me or one of the elders. We are happy to pray for you anytime. We're not hard to find. And I, think, I think a few of us will be up here during, during the song if you want prayer now. But I would just encourage you, find, find some believers that are around you and ask him to pray for you um, and see how God continues to extend his grace. Y'all please stand with us.